Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for May 7th, 2009. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, home brewer Joshua Smith joins us to tell us how to make candy syrup for our Belgian beers. Joshua has been uh, doing extensive experiments in his kitchen, playing with sugar to find interesting flavors, and he's willing to share his results with us. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And you can follow me on Twitter, my username, Basic Brewing, all one word. And you can find me on Facebook. My username there is Basic Brewing James. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook. And if you become a fan of the show there, I'll be sending out occasional notices when shows are posted and such like that. We've still got Brewer's Logbooks. Very few. You can check them out in our online store, basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's been clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us bring you this show, and we appreciate your support. And while I'm self-promoting here, we also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. Just a reminder, the deadline to submit your data for the Basic Brewing Radio Brew Your Own Magazine Collaborative Experiment is just around the corner, May 15th. I've already received a couple of entries. One was from the Netherlands and one from Australia. I've also heard from other brewers domestically who are participating, and I'm looking forward to seeing more data there. You can find the form to submit your data at basicbrewing.com slash experiment. And you can find a PDF there that you can download to use as a worksheet to collect your data as you're going through the experiment. You may remember a couple weeks ago we heard from a brewer who had a bad experience dry hopping in the bottle. Well, Nicholas from Columbia, Missouri wrote in with a different perspective. Nicholas says, I have no idea what Pete did to make his beer foam over when dry hopping in the bottle. I've done it before and it works fine. I've had a few different varieties of hop pellets I wanted to taste, and I had a few bottles of Budweiser that my brother-in-law gave me. Seemed like a good plan. Nicholas says, I popped the bottles, added a single pellet in each, labeled them accordingly, and took them out when my friend came over a few days later. We did have to filter out the hop matter, but I just used a wire mesh strainer. Since the original hops in Bud is so low... You know, it's not it's not triple hopped. <clears throat> uh, it was a great way to pick out the flavors of the dry hops, and it made pretty decent beer. So there you go. If somebody leaves some Budweiser in your fridge, you can fix it. <laughs> Thanks, Nicholas. I appreciate that. And uh, I want to try this with a uh, with a cone or two of my homegrown Cascades. That would be a lot of fun. Dustin from somewhere in western North Dakota writes in with a potential brewing disaster story. Dustin says, I had a few friends over to brew a sure-to-be-tasty pale ale. We were out on my deck, or porch, in your neck of the woods, on the second story of a three-story building. It was about 10.30 at night, and all was going great, when all of a sudden, from above, came a strange flopping sound and a rain of gravel and dirt. My neighbor above was shaking out a rug. I had to make it, make a dive for the brew pot, hoping not too much of that uh, of what was on her shoes was ending up in the beer. I got a pretty good dose of the dirt, and I'm just hoping my beer does not suffer too much from this catastrophe. Wow. Sorry to hear about that, uh, Dustin. No homebrew for the neighbor, I'm assuming. Hope that turns out okay regardless. You could name it Magic Carpet Ale or something like that. John from Banger, Maine, writes, I, I and I've been chastised on this. I've, I've been corrected for, for I, hope, I hope I'm pronouncing Banger, Maine correctly. I think I said Bangor last time. Or maybe I'm getting it wrong again. Anyway, up there in Maine, John writes, I just wanted to comment to the listener who asked about doing a split boil for an all-grain batch. I recently did a party guile brew, and in order to boil both the big beer... And the little beer, at the same time, I did a split boil for the little beer. It was a smoked ESB. Mm. 
This was about a month ago, and I have some finished bottles at this point that taste fine. I'm sure it would have been different if I boiled it all together, but I don't have any problem with the results I got. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. It's always good to hear from somebody who's actually done uh, what I'm recommending doing or suggesting that it's okay to do. Following the interview last week with uh, Jason Perkins from Allagash Brewery on spontaneous or natural fermentation, I got this from John in Mountain View, California. John says, I have been naturally fermenting beer for about four years now, and they're not too bad. I use only barley, no wheat. Trying to research this process is nearly impossible, and no one I know was willing to make anything for fear of contaminating their cellar. Then I saw the Allagash YouTube video about three years ago and became more inspired. John says, here's what I do. After the boil, the wort is left outside for 24 hours to cool. Then it's closed up, allowing the fermentation to complete, usually around two weeks. Next, it goes to secondary for another week. Finally, it's stored for a year. John says, I've brewed pale ales and stouts. I've stored the beers in glass carboys with oak chips and plain stainless steel fermenters. These beers are sour. Only one out of six batches were too nasty to drink. Not everyone likes this flavor, but I'm still learning. Now, I asked John if there are certain times of the year in his area uh, that are the best to brew these naturally fermented beers, and John wrote back saying, uh, seasons seem to play a role. My first batch was brewed in midsummer. It was okay, but there was too much flavor of melted butter. I wonder if that was diacetyl. The second batch was uh, brewed in the winter and tossed out. It took a lot longer for fermentation to start, and it wasn't sour. I can't describe it. I just didn't want it in my mouth. After this experience, I read more about lambics and brewed a pale ale in the early spring with cascade hops because I had no access to aged hops. This beer was really good. That was, again, in the early spring. It tasted like an ale with the similar but very mild buttery flavor and a nice tang that took over the cascades flavor but still had a good aroma. Uh, late next fall, I used the same recipe and the flavors were more bland. This batch seemed to take a while to start fermenting. The last batch was made that following spring and turned out similar to the previous spring. Interesting. I wonder if the yeast themselves, John says, I wonder if the yeast themselves pick up off flavors from their environment and through the summer and fall seasons pass it on to the beers. Interesting. Spring seems to be when everything is fresh. Well, that's... Uh, I've got no knowledge to uh, to guess what's going on there, but uh, I'm assuming that there are just different bugs in the air. But uh, very cool. I, I appreciate your your bravery, John, uh, and your willingness to give this uh, natural fermentation a shot. And more importantly, I appreciate your taking time to share the results. So in the middle of summer, not so good. In the middle of winter, definitely not so good. But the spring... And fall better with the spring being the best, it sounds like, around uh, Mountain View, California. Excellent. That uh, makes me want to try it all the more, maybe this fall. Now, I think I've covered all that I need to cover before the interview. Now, as often happens, I received an email from Joshua Smith telling me about his experiments with making candy syrup. It was a nicely detailed note of his processes and results, and as often happens, I thought, well, there's a show. Well, Joshua Smith, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be talking to you. You wrote an email about your experiments in, in making uh, candy sugar, I guess we can call it, and I wanted to get together with you and, and talk about the details of what you found out. But first, let's go into your background and tell us a little bit about your background as a brewer and as a, as a candy maker. Well, it actually started out in high school. Uh, we had a biology class, and we ended up making wine and then a couple of weeks later distilling it. And then a couple of months later, my parents found me making, I guess, something akin to hooch in my basement. <laughs> um a few years later, I grew up and actually went to the uh, 
the the beer and wine store and, and figured out what I was doing and got into it. Uh, made a few batches of wine, and then a couple of years later, I went and bought the basic stuff for making uh, for for brewing beer. Uh, that was about two years ago, and sort of brewed off and on. I, I did a couple extracts, and I went straight into all grain after that. And on the candy side, I, I once had a recipe for peanut brittle that was absolutely wonderful, and I lost the recipe when I was. Uh, moving or condensing recipe files or something and never quite got the recipe quite right again but I did a lot of you know research on internet and different cookbooks about cooking sugar and, and candy making and got used to the different temperatures and how to use candy thermometers and whatnot and it, candy making is uh, it's may not as be as easy as as we think or or is it as easy as we think well if you pay attention it's pretty easy uh, you got to pay attention to your thermometer um and you got to kind of have a plan of action as you're going you got to have all your equipment ready otherwise you end up with a, a big block of sugar and you know nothing to do with it afterwards <laughs> So, so tell us about this experiment. How did you get inspired into uh, playing with uh, with this kind of uh, candy sugar? Well, I had uh, read Mosher's book, uh, what is it, Radical Brewing, mm-hmm. a couple months ago, and then I looked up your show with the different Belgian candy sugars and sort of put two and two together, and one night I was on my way home and stopped at the grocery store, uh, bought a bunch of sugar and a bunch of corn syrup and decided I'd play around with it the next day because I had a couple days off in a row there. And, and the rest is played history. around with it, came up with different uh, temperatures and, and different processes. I, I tried using citric acid to help with the sugar inversion at first, but it sort of left a really astringent flavor in, in the different syrups it came up with, so I quit doing that pretty quick. And a few days later, I had about 12 jars of syrup and some notes that go, go along with them. So, and, and you've got an understanding spouse, I hope? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, well, she sort of got a little tired of all the jars of sticky stuff laying around. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, for the most part, she was tolerant of it. Uh, <laughs> she didn't like tasting some of the more bitter, astringent syrups that I came up with at first. Well, basically, um, I want to talk about the process, but your basic ingredients are just table sugar, water. Yeah, just, just plain table sugar, cane, uh, sucrose, cane sugar, mm-hmm. and uh, diammonium phosphate and water. Now, where do you get diammonium phosphate, and, and what is well, that? Well, it's, uh, it's, I get it from the, uh, the, the, the home brew shop. It's yeast nutrient, I think they call it. Mm-hmm. It's... Uh, Used to uh, in in low nutrient solutions, it's used to replace the nitrogen and the phosphate that the yeast would normally be using to uh, synthesize building materials and whatnot. So it's readily accessible. Oh yeah, especially to brewers. Um, now, what what was your basic process? I mean, how do you? I guess each of these uh, different batches that you uh, that you made up starts with the the same or similar basic process. You just kind of tweak ingredients and, and tweak the timing in these things, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. The, uh, the basic recipe was two pounds of sugar and I believe a half cup of water when I started cooking the sugar. And then there was a, the, the diammonium phosphate. You know, Moja recommends what was it, nine grams per pound? And I tried that, and I tried uh, four and a half grams per pound. And they both seemed to come up with the, about similar results in the caramelization, or the the Millard reaction, I guess you would call it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what's the, what does the DAP do to the process? I mean, why, why, why do you need that? Well, the, the DAP is a molecule composed of ammonium and, and uh, dehydrated phosphoric acid. And when you heat it up, it decomposes into the, the, the two ammonia molecules and then the phosphoric acid molecule. 
and the sugar and the, the nitrogen and the ammonia get together and it creates the Maillard reactions that uh, ultimately give you your different caramel and, and vanilla and tobacco type flavors. Hmm. So how do we get started? I, I sort of name these by color. The most basic one is rose. Uh, it's clear, but it's kind of got a real slight reddish hue to it. Really, it doesn't have much other taste than, than sugar. Hmm. And I use two pounds of sugar, one cup of water is what it was. Um, and for this, I used just a half a teaspoon of the diammonium phosphate. I found when I started using the entire uh, nine grams that in these lower range sugars, there was a strong ammonium flavor af- afterwards because it doesn't fully react and volatize with with the solution. So, hmm. But anyway, I, I took the sugar and over medium heat, uh, I would cook it with the water, and it took five or ten minutes to hit about 250 degrees from, from room temperature. And then after that, I added a half cup of water, and the half cup of water was to, to uh, stop the cooking. And then after that, I continued to cook it over medium heat until it hit a temperature called softball, which is 240 degrees, which gives you a real nice thick syrup whenever you package it up in a jar. And that's that. Yep. Sounds sounds simple, but the, are there any tricks? You say that you don't want to stir as it's cooking. Do you stir yeah, to... Yeah, one an, thing I learned in candy making was if you stirred, especially at these lower temperatures, sugar crystals would start to reform. Um, so you just kind of let it boil there until you hit your temperatures and you add your, your water, and that's when you stir because at that point you've got enough water to support the... the um, the sugar solution without it crystallizing. Now, do you stir initially when you when you initially put the sugar in with the water and the diammonium phosphate, or do you just lump it well, all I, together? I dissolve the diammonium phosphate into the water, and then I just add that to the sugar, and I let it start heating. Um, you don't get any uh, burnt residues or anything because the, the sugar burns at such a high temperature. Hmm. Uh, let's see here. Regular sucrose, I believe, burns around 250 degrees, or I mean 350 degrees. So it's it's uh, quite a bit higher than all my temperatures even require in the first place. So, so the, you, you don't have to worry about it uh, scorching on the bottom of the pan if you don't. Yeah, there's uh, very little scorching, if any, you know, in in this process. Um, what's really happening is the Maillard reactions, the, the nitrogen and the sugars are combining to form all the different compounds in the solution. So is there anything other than a candy thermometer that you need uh, as far as extra equipment? Well, I would recommend a, a thick bottom pot to help evenly distribute the, the temperature, the, the heat. Other than that, not really. Um, I used a pastry brush to help kind of wash sugar crystals down the side of the pot. Um, I don't really know if that's necessary. It's just Well, if, that, if that's a part of your process that uh, that you've developed over time and it works. Yeah, with, I, with the candy making, you, you just you, you wash down the sugar crystals with a little bit of water if they start to rise up the pot. Now, you said that there is a dangerous part. Oh, yeah, whenever whenever you add the uh, the second dose of water into this, uh, because it's so much higher than boiling temperature, you get a lot of spitting and sputtering and uh, sticky napalm-like sugar solution kind mm. of spitting out of the pot at you. And I imagine molten sugar wants to stick to you. <laughs> yeah, and because it has such a high uh, thermal capacity, it doesn't cool down quick either while it's sticking to you. Yeah. Well, um uh, and then you say after after you reach your your end temperature, uh, you put it in put the pan in in cool water to kind of stop the whole process, right? Oh uh, yeah, you can do that. Or, or what I did was actually just pour it into um, preheated mason jars. Um, I preheated them because you know thermal expansion. I didn't want them to crack at temperatures that high. Mm-hmm. So. And that would effectively stop the cooling because it's coming out of the pan, or stop the cooking because it's coming out of the pan. So, so that's the basic process. I mean, you 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 
put all the ingredients in the in the pan initially, turn up the fire, boil it, uh-huh. uh, and then add your your water uh-huh. to cool it down, and then bring it back up to your end temperature, and then cool it after that. Uh-huh. Um, and then just by varying uh, the ingredients a little bit, varying the ingredients and the uh, the initial temperature that you bring it up to, you, you really can create a, a different level of uh, of candy syrups along this line, different colors and grades. So the rose you brought up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, uh-huh. and then the next one that you describe is called light. And that is uh-huh. two pounds of sugar, one cup of water, one teaspoon of dap, and then three quarters of a cup of water to stop the process. Uh huh. And what changes did you see with that one? Um, with that one, it really had a nice light apricot color. There were some some flavors associated with it. Uh, I sort of thought it had a peach, like like peach fruit and white grape juice type of flavor. And very soft, almost hidden vanilla flavors. Hmm. Yeah. And so you that had, one was pretty good for a real light syrup. Um, it could, it, it, it was easily tasty as a syrup by itself. And you haven't brewed with any of these yet, right? No, not yet. I would, I would love to, to, uh, you know, that'd be a good excuse for a for a uh, small batch to to try some of these out. Yeah, I've, I've got some. Some different wines right now, my one gallon fermenters. But when those clear up, I was going to do some different uh, experiments to test fermentability and, and final flavors of these, also. So, what's the what? How much do you get in the end? I mean, if you start with two pounds of sugar, do you wind up with two pounds of uh, candy syrup at the end? Well, there's some water left over, and uh, you know, I, I I never did weigh it, but. I imagine it's slightly more than two pounds because of the, the residual water. Mm-hmm. Um, two pounds of sugar is slightly more than a quart when you measure by volume. And after making the syrups, I had slightly less than a quart of liquid. So it really condenses and cooks down whenever you do that, too. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we were talking before we started recording, you know, the, that uh, liquid candy syrup that you can get, uh, that you can purchase for brewing. You know, it's fairly expensive, so you could you could probably save a, a bunch of money if you brew a lot of Belgians uh, this way. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, let, let's kind of go on down the list a little bit. Light amber uh, stopped at 270 degrees Fahrenheit, and that was uh, two pounds of sugar, one cup of water, one and a half teaspoons of dap, and then one cup of water at the end. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. And you you. And, s- um, you describe the the flavor of that one. That one, uh, well, it developed much more of an amber and, and red tone color. Uh, the flavor of this one was much more caramelly. There were some soft, sweet f- fruit flavors, uh, sort of grape, sort of raisiny. Um, again, with kind of plums and, and dried apricot, but they were very mild. There was also sort of a spice flavor, vanilla and cardamom, that I tasted in it. Hmm. Yeah. So, so at the, at at this point, you you start to get it. You know, the darkening of the colors and darkening of the flavors uh, around this point, and it starts to kind of get more rich and 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 deep and and dark fruits. Yeah, right. Right around two seventy is is when the the real flavors start to develop. Um, consequently, two seventy is also a temperature and candy making candy making that they call soft crack hmm. which is where your your hard candies start to solidify at and, and turn into solid sugar whenever you cool it down huh now how do you keep from uh, how do you keep this stuff from solidifying or, or turning into hard candy on you well that's that's done whenever you add the uh, the second addition of water. Um, at that point, you only heat it back up to soft ball, which is 240 degrees, um, and that gives you a real nice syrupy consistency once you get it in the jar. Huh. Now, the, we, the next stop is uh, medium amber. That's two, uh-huh. 280 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. And at this color, um, it's really a nice amber color, kind of almost what you would, would expect to see from... 
Oh, you know the the, the petrified tree sap that, that's called amber. Mm-hmm. That's that's the color that this is. Real dark, kind of orangey, slightly red colors in it. Um, and you really start to notice the caramels. And let's see here, in my notes I say uh, this is really where the spice, the cardamom, and the the deeper plum flavors begin to develop. And there's also a little bit of roasty flavor. Um, not quite the bitter roastiness of toast yet, though. Um, more like a, a soft, light roasted coffee type flavor. Now, you on this one, you you had uh, two pounds of sugar, one cup of water, two teaspoons of the dap, and then one and a quarter cup of water. So yeah, yeah, you use one and a quarter cup of water to bring the temperature down, and that's just because the the initial temperatures so high at 280 it requires more water to bring it back down to that softball uh, temperature so again you you hit the you bring it to a boil you bring it up to this initial uh, 280 degrees fahrenheit then you hit Mm -hmm. it with the water to bring it back down and and then uh, and and it once you add more more water it still requires a little more cooking to get up to 240 degrees but Mm -hmm. because the temperature is so low you're basically out of the Millard range. Uh, like I said, I believe the, the real strong Millard flavors start right around 270 degrees. Mm. And then the, then the deep amber, uh, 290. Yeah, deep amber, that was my favorite. It's at uh, 290 degrees. Uh, really red, dark-colored syrup. Um, really strong raisin and plum flavors. Uh, sort of a toasted coffee flavor. At this point, there's a little bit of uh, rummy, mild, woody flavors, um, and, and really strong, complex caramels, sort of like you would expect from sucking on toffee or, or a hard caramel candy. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that that was with uh, two and a half teaspoons of DAP and then one and one half cup of water. Mm-hmm. Um, what, how big of a pan do you have to have? Well, I was using a, a three-quart pan for this for this um, batch with two pounds. Um, and when it starts boiling, there's a lot of expansion. It was pretty close to the top during the, the, the peak of the boil. So, And again, this is not something you want to boil over on your stove. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, you, you'd be uh, cleaning that for a while. <laughs> you'd be in the doghouse for sure, along with your oh, yeah. many jars yeah. of sugar. You. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, you went up to a 300 degrees Fahrenheit for what you call mahogany. Mm-hmm. And uh, now, did you is did you go too far on this one, or, or what kind of uh, characteristics did you get out of this one? Well, I don't think I went too far, um, but it definitely wasn't as, as tasty as the 290 degrees. Hmm. Um, it was more of a brown color, so I believe there was a little bit of scorching beginning there. Mm. Um Let's see, fructose actually caramelizes or, or burns slightly lower than the other sugars. And as you're boiling it, the, the sucrose divides up into glucose and fructose, hmm. um, a process called inversion. Mm-hmm. And the uh, I, I believe at this point your fructose is really starting to burn, and that's where some of these bitter and sort of unpleasant tart flavors are coming from. Hmm. So yeah, you- it, it, to me it seemed like 290 was sort of that peak temperature to bring it up to. Now, you, you added three teaspoons of DAP and then cooled it down with a one and three quarters cup uh-huh. of water. So which of these would you rather, I mean, if you were making like, say, a, well, I guess it depends on which kind of a double you or a Belgian you were making, whether you're making a double or a triple, but which yeah. of these would you rather brew with? Well, probably the, the deep amber, the 290 degrees. Um, that's where I found the the strongest Millard flavors without any of the the sharp bitter or um, um, tart flavors that came from 300 degrees. Uh, you know, maybe for a triple, something like the light. I don't know the rose. The, there were no flavor characteristics. That was just a plain sugary sweetness from the rose syrup, and that that again was at 250 degrees. So. Mm-hmm. Now, all of those you, you classify as, as a sugar number four. Yeah, that, that's just in reference to the different processes that I tried. The, the first few, I tried adding different uh, grades of citric acid and tartaric acid and winemaker's acid blend, too. And all of those had a really 
accurate taste, I, I guess I want to say. And I'm believing that the acid molecules are burning at these temperatures. So, oh. so the, the, I mean, so far, I mean, you've got you've got another one that we want to talk about, but this is this this is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, um, these actually don't take too long to make. A 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes for the hotter ones. Um, but most of it is spent just watching the thermometer, making sure you don't go past your target temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, up until you cool it down and and uh, bring it up to the softball temperature. So now you describe the process of sugar number five. Well, sugar number five. Um, w- when you look at the Belgium candy website, they they show that the syrups are actually cooked multiple times. So I thought I would do this with my 290 degree or my deep amber or dark amber, deep amber sugar that I made. So I, I did the basic process. I used two pounds of sugar, one cup of water, and uh, actually three teaspoons of the DAP for this one. And I cooked it up to 290, and then I added the, the water. I added one cup of water, and this brought it down to just about 235. And I began cooking it again all the way up to 290 again to, to completely go through the process again. And... Then I added one more cup of water and brought it back up to 240 for the softball. And what I got was a really deep, dark-colored syrup, really flavorful. Um, I guess I call it a double-cooked syrup. So. Hmm. Now, now is this uh, is this like the 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 290, but more so, or, or yeah, it's it? basically the 290. Everything about it is just enhanced without having to go over to the 300 degrees. Hmm. So so you stop just short of where you start to develop these bitter flavors. And then you, you recook it, which just keeps developing the flavor. So it's 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 kind of like, uh, well, it's double cooking. I mean, it's taking yeah. something and, and uh, bringing it right to the point where you like it, and then you bring it down and do it again. And, and like you said, you get more of those... Uh, those characteristics without having the chemical or physical reactions that give you the nastiness of the uh, of the higher temperatures. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so how long can you keep these? Well, the, the sugar number four is not shelf-stable. After about three days, you start to see sugar crystals develop in it. And I, I believe it would be perfectly fine to use for brewing at this point but the syrup itself is starting to separate into sugar crystals and and uh millard compounds and and water compounds um now one thing i noticed sugar number five the double cooked one it's been several weeks since i did the initial experiment and it still hasn't separated so i believe quite a few more of the sugars have burnt away in this one or or not burnt but the gone through the Millard reaction and the sugar, the syrups become stable. Hmm. So, so what's the consistency of the, is it like uh, pancake syrup or? A little thicker, more like honey, more like room temperature honey. Hmm. So it would be um, fairly easy to work with. Yeah, it would, it's, it's really easy to work with. Um, just a little preheating of the jar and it just slips right out, so. So you, you uh, say in your initial note that uh, you could use corn syrup in the process at some point? Yeah, Mosher u- used corn syrup. Um, I'm sort of a big whole foods geek, so I corn syrup just kind of bothers me, you know, <laughs> um, as it's a much more processed sugar than the, than the table sugar is. Mm-hmm. So I tried a few batches with it. They were just as tasty. There was nothing wrong with it. But I was experimenting for my own use, and I figured I'm going to use table sugar when I do this myself. So, so, so I, I continued the experiments with the with the table sugar. So, what are you going to do with all these jars of uh, sugary syrup? Well, I, I've gone ahead and gotten rid of uh, the ones that were kind of bitter and acrid and unpleasant. And I've got about uh, four jars sitting around now. Uh, one of them that's solidifying uh i've got some bamboo skewers and i'm making rock candy from it oh um 
you know, some of them I might try fermenting some and using them in a in a brew. And like I said, I made some caramel ice cream from sugar number five. Now, what uh, what would you t- if someone were to uh, try this after hearing our conversation, and that someone may be me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what would you uh, tell us, novice uh, candy makers? Uh, that would help us the most? I mean, what do we have to keep in mind the most in this process? What do we got to watch out for? Well, I I would say the first thing you want is the candy thermometer or a deep fry thermometer. Um, As you can tell from my notes, the the flavors change drastically as the temperature changes. Mm -hmm. And once you get to 290 to 300, you know, you're really risking overshooting the flavor. When I cooked it, I tried some on medium high and a, and a batch on high. And once you get over medium on the stove, you know, I don't know what this equates to in watts or power units or heat, but it just seemed once I got past medium, I started to develop some really burnt, bitter flavors, even at the lower temperature syrups. So I would stay away from too hot of a heat. And thirdly, you know, the, the sputtering, the splattering from adding the, the water, the kind of a dangerous situation there so you kind of want to use a longer spoon when you get to that and uh kind of stand back a little bit it, it would seem to me that if you're one one of the other benefit of cooking over a medium heat as over a high heat is that if you're trying to reach these temperatures you don't want to shoot past it too quickly or you, you don't want to rush from one temperature mark to the other yeah that, that would be another thing and, and i believe the extended cooking time also adds more of a robust flavor to it. Um, that makes sense. So, so what is the time difference between you know each of these ten degrees? Uh, at, down at the lower end, you're looking at uh, three to five minutes between each ten degree difference. But as it gets hotter and hotter, the the thermal mass declines, so you, it, it starts moving faster and faster. I would say between two seventy and two ninety, you've got about two minutes of cook time. So. Hmm. So it is important to be vigilant. Yeah, so it, it's uh, flying by those temperatures pretty quickly once you get to around 270. Well, that's th- this sounds like fun. Yeah. Uh, what do you uh, have? You reached the the pinnacle of your achievement in in making these uh, candy syrups, or what's what's next on your agenda? Well, I was going to to try several other experiments. Um, one was to take sugar number four, let it crystallize and, and separate, and then take the resultant sugar and cook that a second time, or the, the resultant syrup, you know, strain it off the sugar crystals and then cook that a second time um, to see what I can get there. Uh, I believe I'm going to get a real strong set of Millard flavors with very little fermentable sugars left in it. Hmm. And I was also going to do sugar number five. I was going to cook it three or four times in a row. Again, I believe I'm going to get something real strong without a lot of sugar left in it. Well, that sounds uh, it sounds amazing. As, as as often happens during these conversations about things I've never done, I'm inspired to try it myself. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> so if I have to clean up the kitchen, it's your fault. That's well. Uh, <laughs> That's fine as long as you don't know where I live. So. <laughs> well, all right, Joshua, this has been fun. I yeah, pre- it has. I appreciate your uh, your writing in the in to begin with, and uh, and I appreciate your time today. Well, I, I appreciate you talking to me. Um, it was a chance to to let other people know about what I've been doing. I can't wait to start making my own candy syrups and brewing up some Belgians with them. In fact, I, today I went out and bought a, a candy thermometer so I can start doing that. Very exciting. One final and very important point from Joshua. He says, the other thing I forgot to mention when you asked for precautions for making candy, I forgot to say, don't lick the spoon. <laughs> it's very hot. And even with experience, I've done this more times than I like to recall. By the way, the temptation to lick the spoon is huge. I can see that. But I can also see you don't want molten sugar in your mouth. So, very important. Uh, Do not lick the spoon until the stuff is cool. So, once again, I appreciate Joshua's sharing his experiences and making it pretty easy to understand on how to do this. So, I'm going to do it. Just watch. 
Remember, we've got Brewer's Logbooks and our new Basic Winemaking Introduction to Wine Kits DVD out on our online store. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Please don't forget to tell us where you're from and check your email address. We've got our other uh, DVDs, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, uh, Stepping into All Grain, and Introduction to Extract Home Brewing out there. And we've got combo deals on our store. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. And I'll send it to you myself. We've got shirts as well. And uh, thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are... Actron CP9175 Auto Scanner Diagnostic Diagnostic Code Scanner with freeze frame freeze frame data for OBD2 vehicles and Samsung LN46B650 46, 46 inch 1080p 120 hertz LCD HD TV with red touch of color which I think breaks the record for the most expensive single item ever purchased through the link. So I appreciate your help there. Excellent. I hope you watch lots of wonderful TV. It's a big TV. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. And we do appreciate your support, even with the like single books and things like that at all adds up over time. And don't forget that you can also join the American Homebrewers Association through the associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. And also, you can get a free issue of Brew Your Own Magazine. And if you subscribe after that, you can you can uh, be helping us. Again, all those links and more at basicbrewing.com. Boy, this is like the longest end of the show ever. That's all until next week. Thank goodness. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson, our buddy in Austin. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.